have a, if you assert yourself in any kind of intelligent way, you become a threat to them and they usually just get rid of you. And, um, well, that doesn't have to be a big karma, you know, being threatened or whatever, but when you try to go to work to earn a paycheck and they don't, they deny you the privilege because of some BS, um, then that's a hard thing to, that's a hard thing to digest, you know, when it's supposed to be, when you think about the bigger picture of America or whatever you want to call it, the freedom and the, the career thing or whatever. Yeah. Um, you don't want to, I mean, if you, how do you, how do you prove something like that? You know, like, how do you sit there and go, well, I just videotaped what just happened. And that. the bottom line is you just got to pick up and keep moving you never forward. Know what happens beforehand. Well, I mean, I'm not trying to be irresponsible and say that I'm not responsible. I mean, I have to be responsible for everything, but like I said, freedom of speech is free, but guess what? It comes with consequences. Yeah. And if you choose to not have, um, if you choose to be, um, intelligent enough to maybe be right and catch somebody in a lie yeah. in, in the shelter situation over there. There's retribution you're going to have to receive, and that's just the way it is. And however they divvy that out, it's sad. Should be, right? Well, right, but I'm just saying that no, if they if they choose if they choose a lie and I catch them, why why am I the one that's going to receive retribution? If all I'm doing is catching them in a lie, that was it was insignificant to me, but it was still the point that they were dumb enough to pull it and test me, and then um, you know, then my stuff goes missing or something like that, and you, and they they were supposed to be the well, one holding. We're going to come back to this. I said to do a little intro. Yeah. Do a little intro, and then we're going to dive into everything. So we can make this as productive as possible. Maybe you can learn something. Maybe I can learn something. Well, that's the only reason why I really want to do it. Yeah, I'm yeah. learning something from you. I learned that so like quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. It's yeah, cool. it is. All right, we're gonna start it up. What's good? It's your boy Jungle Jay, hot and ready, live and direct. Change the world, person at a time. We are here with the Jungle Story, the Jungle Podcast, where we are bringing stories to reality. We are here with my brother. Well, and you can call me Juan. Juan. We were here with Juan. I actually met him at the bus station, and I just chopped up a conversation, and now we are here. And why are we here? Because I believe that everyone's story has a message, and with that message has a meaning that has a purpose. And this man, actually, I could have interviewed other people here, but I waited because I wanted to understand more about his story and where he's at. And he already had a positive mind framework when I was talking to him. So I said, and I told him that I would also help him out at the end of this, and I'd stick to my word. So starting this out. Hmm. Just tell me a little about yourself and kind of how you found yourself in this situation, brother. I, uh, well, let's see. I was, um, I seem to be successful in my life when I chose to be successful in the sense that um, I, uh, if you surround yourself with successful people, usually it's pretty easy. And I say success in the sense that I never had to have a significant amount of money to be happy, but, you know, like live at just a working class level. And, uh, but I always lived in an environment, um, in my mind, I guess you could say. Um, it definitely was in my mind that um, did transpire too well into society, I guess. I, uh, well, I just, um, I enjoy, um, I just enjoy, uh, I guess, um, recreational things that are um, sometimes, sometimes nefarious, I guess, by nature. <laughs> for lack of, for lack of a less uh, difficult word. Do you guys need to talk or? Okay, cool. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so, anyways, um, I always, I was always self-supporting, or, or maybe I had a significant other, like we were codependent. But um, I always educated myself well, and anything. I, I grew up in a family where that um, uh, my father was self-employed, but uh, basically, um, he was um, well, he wasn't a hands-on dad, which wasn't a bad thing in the sense that he didn't, um, he was never not warm and emotional. But uh, I was just the youngest, and if I wanted to learn something, I had to learn it on my own, pretty much. Yeah, so I would just, I would read or something like that. And uh, throughout life, that just made me have a, I always had an independent mind, and, and I never wanted to be put in a box. That caused me friction in school because, uh, well, it wasn't an authority issue, but, you know, the authorities were there to try to keep you in a box, so to speak. And uh, they didn't nurture that. And uh, I, I acted out in ways like, uh, you know, recreational drugs were a thing. Uh, did you try other drugs? Or? Oh yeah, I used to, I was I was smoking crack in the nineties. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean like uh, I'm not ashamed of that because you know what I don't think I would have I would be uh, in a position where I have the safety and knowledge that I do now to protect myself um, from uh, other aspects of addictional substance addicting substance and so to speak because uh, if you could live through something like that and uh, you know you learn how that you learn how to play tricks with yourself and cope with yourself and coping mechanisms. What do you think you're not ashamed of that because? learned a lot from it? Is, is yeah, that... I mean, I learned a tremendous amount from it. Uh, Have you still done it in the past and how? Yeah, I mean, you know, when I chose to, uh, like it was never, an, it never became an issue to where I was like, um, it had control of me, uh, the, other than the first time because I wasn't prepared for how powerful it was. Uh, the PSAs at the time, I felt like were like propaganda. 
like, oh, it can't be that bad. Well, well it was that bad. <laughs> you don't, yeah, you don't think, you don't think at some, some point in time that, that it would take control at some, at some point? Well, I mean, I, the bottom line is that when you're, um, when I was at that age, my mind was not just, my mind was not developed enough to, I think hope is such a, such a powerful thing. It just was not. And uh, I think that's what we're seeing in society today with the blues and the young people is just that, uh, you know, these are, these are like, these are basically like, um, what do you call it? These are repackaged, re reinvented, um, you know, like chick or what do you want to call it? Some kind of mod, like cool thing, like drugs, right? You know, this is basically like a heroin drug, a, f a fentanyl <laughs> synthetic opiates, right? Well, the, the cartel or whoever's at, at, not that I'm trying to blame the cartel, and now the cartel, if you're out there, now please don't blame me. Let's see. <laughs> Blame me for putting guilt on you. I don't know if you're the one totally uh, self self uh, yeah. self guilty uh, guilty of this or whatever I'd say. But anyways, you know the powers that be that created this substance. Um, young people, I, I can't. I wouldn't have been able to cope with it on my mind. Like like you know, I mean, I would have got high on that and been like, wow, dude, this is amazing. I'm not do you, doing a damn do thing think, now. Do you think it was because there were certain questions in your head that you didn't? That you had in your head that you didn't that you wanted to find the answers to and oh absolutely you didn't, you didn't allow yourself and you needed to, you needed to find something outside of yourself to do so um i think the answers that i was looking for were um like i said i had to kind of grow up on my own a little too fast um now was that healthy um I, healthy in my mind but probably not healthy in my actions because mm -hmm. um i was unprepared i had a little too much freedom in the sense that that's where i was spoiled like my dad was so busy sometimes that uh, i was trusted a lot so I became, able, I was able to use, you know, recreational marijuana or whatever when it was still illegal back in the day in the 90s. And I was able to use that heavily. And uh, I knew it was, you know, gateway. I mean, I had already taken LSD by 15, which was, uh, which was, that was like a bad influence situation. But it turned out to be a good thing for me because uh, it never inhibited my life. Like I never used it heavily, but it opened my mind, I guess. But I always approached those things thinking I could be open-minded about it. Now, crack was different because it was such a powerful substance that, um, you know, you, you, I was in denial instantly. I was about to say, there has to be a denial. Part. There was a the denial part, yeah, because right you know, away, you know, you know, there's a certain level, of, whether it be crack, whether it be cocaine, whether it be, yes, much any drug. well, the denial would be that I would, I would tell myself, you know what, you see these PSAs on TV and you think, well, this is propaganda, man, it's not that bad. Okay, so that makes you now willing to try it. Well, I wasn't just willing to jump in and try it because I wasn't that curious about it. I was happy smoking weed, I guess you could say, drinking, underage, whatever. Um, and it, it happened like this. A friend of mine was, he used to sell weed. He used to steal weed from his dad because his dad sold weed. He stole weed from his dad. And he calls me up and it was a high school buddy that I didn't hang out with regularly, but I bought weed from at school. So he calls me up and I say, what do you need to ride for somewhere, man? Don't you have a scooter? And he's like, well, he wouldn't tell me exactly why. And I said, I don't need to know why because um, it sounds like it's something that I don't need to be involved in. Mm. But I will take your offer, though, and be involved in it. But the less I know, the better off I am so I can protect myself. And I drove him where you needed to go. The you know, the better off you protect yourself? Yes, because I, there would be no repercussions of me, like, uh, being drilled for something, information. So I made this deal with him. To, he wanted to sell some weed, and then he was going to a crack dealer. Let's put it that way. Well, don't, Steve, you think, don't you think, if you, if you know your friend, don't you think knowing what that information would have been? would have been Right, well, what I'm saying is I was comfortable with the information I got and okay. knew and was aware oh, of to make, all I was doing, the, 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 the delivery process was not something that I was worried about because I'm just driving across town in a couple of miles. If I obey the traffic laws, then I'm um, okay. If I don't obey the traffic laws, that's on me. And I, if I get us caught, whatever. So was it more with him? Was it more of, all right, there's a scene that he says, hey. Maybe he's trying to protect me from it. I don't know. Yeah, well, there's a scene where he asks his friend, hey, we're going to hurt a lot of people. Don't ask any questions. Don't ask me about, about no. it later. Or, no, or, I don't know. you were just like, yeah. That's what it sounds like. Yeah, yeah, I'm down. Yeah, no, who's, yeah. Who's caught? Who's caught? It, it wasn't that kind of, yeah, it wasn't that kind of an excitement level because. Um, okay, I thought, I mean, with the, with the decision making process that you were going through with that. Yeah, well, it, it, like it, it, it was, was simple. Like, okay. It was a simple process of like, okay, I like to smoke weed. I'm going to get a large quantity of marijuana as payment. Um, the, the distance is extremely significant. And um, I'd never known weed to hurt anybody tremendously. I left yeah. it at that. Okay, okay. Gotcha. So, it was just weed. Yeah, party is, but, but what I did not know at the time, though, is that he was trading the weed for a more powerful substance for himself. Now, what was funny about this was that he left me outside the vehicle. I mean, he left me with the, in with the vehicle outside of this guy's house for a long period of time. And I could just feel in my bones that this was not a situation that makes me comfortable. You're kind of putting this guy on blast or whatever. So I told him that I wasn't going to do it again when he got back in the car, whatever it was he did, because I knew it was something nefarious that I didn't want to be involved in any more than I was. So I just said, I'm not going to do it again, dude. So whatever, uh, done deal. Thanks for the stuff, but whatever, you know, thanks for the weed. And then he will cause me back up and ask me to do it again. And so we negotiated a deal somehow. And I, well, so basically I told him, I said, I'm not going to sit in the car because that kind of like puts this guy on the spot. So if you can invite me in, 
I'll mind my business. I don't need to be any more involved. And then you can tend to your thing and pay me like normally and I'll do it. Well, this guy was a savvy crack dealer, okay? <laughs> he wasn't a street corner dealer. That was some thug like Hollywood carbon copies and makes everybody look like they're just all some, you know, evil street guy, street dealer or something. This guy was a guy that um, he had a motorcycle accident that got, gave him a significant amount of money for, from a settlement. He paid for his mom's house. She was retired. And uh, he set up shop in the basement and he would invite you in. And uh, me, I wasn't really interested. I, uh, I was curious, but I was getting my curiosity satisfied by watching the people around me do this stuff. And they were all doing crack? Yeah, he had, well, he had a couple customers in there at a time and they could use a little bit and then go, you know. Okay. He would weigh it out and cook it right before you and, and serve it, you know. But he was really friendly in the sense that he, I noticed a chessboard just to break the ice when I was sitting in this uncomfortable situation. Oh, you, you play chess? I, I mentioned it's a chessboard and then he, he, he jumped on that and he snared me in by going, hey, you like to play chess? Let's play chess. And he kept bringing me back to play chess with him. And when he was playing chess with me, he would smoke crack for himself. He'd take a hit every now and then. And he, he could see that I was watching, like intently, I guess. So then he would offer me some. And I didn't get it because I didn't know how to hit it right. And then when I learned how to hit it right, I was off to the races. <laughs> and once I was off to the races, he was a smart dealer. And then he starts, when I start asking for it, he starts pulling back. So he just got me hooked like that. And it, it wasn't a long uh, addiction process because... Uh, I learned that if you just don't hang out with crackheads, then you could stop smoking crack pretty easily. But uh, because your environment dictates. Right, it's it's a doing. mental thing. But tell, I'll tell you mentally, um, it was the so the same, the same egg that is boiled in the water that is soft. Yeah, like well, I, yeah, but I always had that mental muscle where I was like, you know, I, I guess I was cocky and arrogant, and I always thought that uh, that's what gets me in trouble. Is that uh, so? That what led to you to being homeless at that point? No, no, um, not by t uh, I, my homelessness was actually not for bad choices, really. I was actually so good at something that it, I wasn't, you could be too good at things. And if you're too good at something and you're making another party look bad, um, and that matters to that other party, that can be a reason why you, they don't want you around anymore, and neither did their mother. <laughs> so what, you had a girlfriend that no, you had a job? No, I had an ex-wife that I was living with still, and um, she was cool. She saw me through prison and whatnot and all, that, all those hard times and was good. And... Uh, I was on the up, like in the sense that when I got out, I was doing everything right. I wasn't, I wasn't using any substances, you know. I was, weird. but the relationship was just souring over time because, unbeknownst to me at the time, her mom was making some serious moves behind the scenes. Even though she was a grown-ass woman, she was tolerating her mom, like making her uncomfortable with me and all this crap. And I didn't know it, but at the time, uh, I, 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 let's just put it this way: it was very um, passive-aggressive. So I was seeing the writing on the wall and prepared to leave. I didn't want to fight with her. And um, it got to the point where um, I thought, well, you know what? I was thinking about my future. And I said, you know what? I'm not getting any younger. I would like to have another child. She didn't want to have kids. She never talked. In the beginning, that was okay with me. I asked her if I could have one opportunity to try to make a child with her. And she, uh, she didn't think she was going to. And I told her, I, I'm going to have to call you on that because, well, I had strong swimmers from the first time because I, I had a child plan before that. I had right. you talked about beforehand that you wanted kids? I just threw this out. No, I never did at the time when I was with her. We were together 13 years. I'm surprised you're married. You may become a married man, and I'd ask that question. Yeah, so that's like um, a prerequisite. Well, well, I'd already had child. I'd raised a child with somebody else, so I was kind of satisfied at that time. I guess uh, I wanted to kind of let my hair down and be loose with her. Now I wanted to have a child because I was thinking about my future, and I was thinking about if I had, could have a little. Legacy. Yeah, I was thinking about if I could have a little girl, not the legacy of like my life in the sense of uh, carrying it on, but if I could have a little girl and I have nobody else because I lose my my ex or um, you know because her family was we were not really on good terms and. Uh, I said, if I have a little girl and I just treat her, if I raise her right and I treat her the way a little girl needs to be treated, you know, teach her self-respect and just, she'll be my best friend and maybe she'll let me live with her as opposed to being at home. Because I was thinking that far ahead because I know that with my lifestyle choices that uh, being at home probably won't be very good on my body and because uh, I've been hard on it, you know. I'm not suffering tremendously, but, you know, I feel like it's going to be hard on me at some point and uh, I'd much rather have somebody close to me than dying alone, you know. And uh, I just thought it was really cool because little girls are amazing. I've never had one of my own. And then I, I got my, I made this wish. My, my, my significant uh, partner at the time agreed to it. And she didn't believe, I guess, I was going to get it. And I got all three wishes across the board, a healthy child, a little girl. And uh, she was able to have a child. <laughs> so I win, 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 right? And I think, hey, what could go wrong here? Now this will be the glue that will bond the relationship together, yeah. right? Maybe this is what she needs. And, um, well... She wanted to be a hands-off mom. She wanted to let me take the, the helm. She was not, she had like postpartum depression. She wasn't very interested in the first place. I had no issue with that because I love being a hands-on dad. It gives me purpose. So I thought this is a bonus for me. Now, now I'll be able to clean up my mess with their family by being a great dad. 
So is this the point where you say, because you, you, you were too good of a dad? That's yeah, well, I was just, I, I hate to sound arrogant, but I was just, I really, really, my daughter was inseparable from me. We were a great, I was a great dad with her. Her mother didn't have a problem with it, but her, her mother had a problem with that. Her mother had a problem with her daughter being a cop out and sitting on the sidelines and not stepping up to the plate. And she was going to push her to do that. And uh, me and her mother didn't get along and never talked because her mom was just like that. So her mom, um, when I made a couple, when I had a couple instances of disagreement with her daughter, that's when her mom took the opportunity to like tighten her grip, I guess. And um, eventually I got to the point where her daughter was being such a, she, she was just being so frustrating that I lost my temper and I yelled a little bit. And then they uh, order protection, boom, you're gone. And um, that was it. That just like that. So and uh, she's not far from here. She's nearby. We're civil. But the matter is that now I face a problem where now how now how do you legally live in the streets and have right, any so part of your daughter's hold on, hold on, hold on. yeah so you, that that divorce happened and yeah then, divorce for and me and my child really you transitioned into either what what, what was that transition that's well I was just because you said you said at the beginning you said it was because something that you were really good at made you into you becoming homeless so did you get divorced and you got really good at something. Well, no, I just, uh, I believe I was such a good father that I made her mother look bad because her, her mother, uh, my child's grandmother, um, was not going to allow that to be so because that's just the type of woman she is. And it didn't matter if she had to take, if she, she's the type of woman that, um, this is the problem I noticed earlier on in the relationship when we were married even. That's why we didn't stay married even though we stayed together. Um, her mother's the type of person that just, um, I guess she doesn't feel like men have a significant role in, 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 um, in relationship in the sense that if she wants a man to be pushed to the side, then he just has to be like subservient or something. And, um, I didn't feel like I was going to allow, I mean, I wasn't fighting like this in a, in a negative way. I was just doing the best that I could because, um, somebody was going to take care of my daughter and I never wanted my daughter to be, I wanted to raise my daughter in my, in my spirit and in my, and in my, you know, I was being, I guess I was being a kind of a control freak, but that was a, that was, I, her mother agreed to that when I decided to have her. So after you, after you, after things split. Decided to make her and have her with my, her mother. I almost sound arrogant. Well, yeah, well, uh, I tried to do, I mean, she wasn't going to allow me to come back. I couldn't, uh, so, without the, or, the bottom line was that regardless of, um, so, um, for being a pervert. Yeah. So the end. Yeah. Merry Christmas. Yeah. Merry Christmas. You. Without your family, bitch. Fuck with me, nigga. How dare you? Fucking weirdo. You know what? Fuck. Where's the cop at? There's a cop. Where's the cop? You the cop? This nigga's a motherfucking kid doing that to me. The um. So yeah. Fuck you. Okay. That's a good sound bite, though, you know what I mean? That's a great sound bite. That's a good, yeah. Well, at least people the know beauty, the environment's the real. experience, brother. Well, we, I mean, not everybody has it. Um, <laughs> we don't all have, we all, we all don't have our minds, like, right at, the, at certain moments. Sometimes I have to drink some get right, you know? I do, because I know that I, when I get angry, it doesn't give me nothing but misery and, and harm. I and you can't judge them one based on their situation. Exactly, you exactly. Never know what they've been through. Exactly. Got to where they're at. Obviously, the behavior is crazy. It's not yeah. Crazy. In other words, I can't side with anybody there. I mean, the bottom line is, she's she's doing what she thinks is her job, and he's doing what he thinks is his job. And what's wrong with that? Yeah. In the end, matters your intention and understanding why you're doing. What's if somebody was to, it's somebody was to disrespect my my significant other, like Frosty, um, yeah, Frosty would handle it, <laughs> and yeah. then I would back her up in a minute. You yeah, know. It seems it seems that's the case. I think we all live vicariously through um, certain things in our lifestyles that uh, feed into certain things, and no matter what, you know. Yeah. Um, I, I was able to catch up on the classics when I was incarcerated, so I read a lot of Hemingway, and when I really. Did you get so? When what was the transition from you from you getting divorced and you incarcerated, then you got to the streets, or? No, I was um I um, I was running in the streets prior to being. Well, I was in that relationship that we were married, the same woman. Yeah. yeah. And um, once well, again, her mother caught it. She allowed her mother to run her life a little bit, which um, I would just stay out of the way, you know, because I mean, like, come on, I'm not going to tell this, the woman I'm with how to live her life. And uh, there were some negative influences there. And then uh, her sister didn't want us to live with her anymore, but she, her sister, her, my, my wife stayed and I ended up on the streets. And that time, that time so, I was immature and bitter about it, you know, so, I was bitter. So you didn't, want to, you didn't have the opportunity to get a job? You didn't have no, I was, uh, I was working. Um, I've, I've worked jobs um, and been in the streets. I had two jobs out here when I was out here. So, um, so what was the first time you, I was, you decided to be in the streets? 
Well, it doesn't matter if you're in the streets. You could you could be in the streets and still like be productive. It doesn't mean that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it doesn't. No, I'm, I'm learning that. I just saying that uh, uh, the streets. Um, what was the first time? The first oh, time. the first time. Um, yeah, because the transition. Because I'm trying to understand. I know. I'm trying to create a timeline here, a synopsis that people can understand. I don't know. Um, it's just that uh, I don't know. 2000, uh, maybe 2005 to. Uh, to 2008 or something like that. So you, maybe, cho- you chose. Yeah. You chose instead of just getting an apartment or anything. You just said. Well, it was never. There was never those tools on the table for me that easily, not, man. Not. They just weren't. I could have money, but I never could reach that income level. You know, I've always. Let's oh, put so this you way. couldn't get approved for a house, or you couldn't get approved for. A yeah, apartment th- those systems. Couldn't... Um, I don't know of any that have been successful. I wouldn't. Um, the ones that I've tried. Now, I mean, I mean, at my at my fault. Um, you know, I was. I didn't have a wall to hang a calendar on, and I'm not saying that's an excuse, but I was unable to follow up on a lot of things. Um, they weren't a top priority because uh, being in the streets never bothered me being exposed to the elements. It's just that, uh, you know, when you have, when you allow other things to come into your life that you enjoy more, well, that alters your landscape to the point where, um, you know, society doesn't really, if you don't conform to it, it's not going to, you're not going to so put up with it. you think you, know? you were suffering, you, you were going through a certain amount of convenience and comfort and yeah. decided to choose that. Yeah, there is over, convenience over, and comfort over, over having a home. Having yeah. Place. Well, I mean, don't get me wrong. But having a phone home is not. I mean, like, what, I mean, a home is, an, and I've had apartments, but uh, you know, th- there's a certain level of commitment and responsibility required with that, and that's not a problem. But you know what? Um, once you're committed, um, then you better. You know, you're not going to just let it fall apart really easily. And I never let it fall apart um, on my end easily. But sometimes there's things that are beyond people's control. Like you could foresee everything. And still be like so blindsided first, a little bit. Day, the first time I lost first, an apartment. First day, first day being being homeless, it was more. You didn't feel you anything. You were losing yourself. Or you lost a part of you. Or? I just felt no. I just felt like I was. I felt like I was up for the challenge and because it was a choice. Was it a choice at that point? Because you said you. Well, were I mean, you know, I could stay in a shelter, but that's still homelessness. Yeah, yeah. So I would just choose to not be in a shelter um, because, uh, well, I I figured why um. Why be around people that are going to be bad influences upon me if I allow them to when I'm good enough as a bad influence upon myself? <laughs> I don't need help. Um, no, what I mean is that um, I just am not very, um, I like people, but um, I have to keep them at a certain distance to socially because, um, well. Do you, do you feel like you would be a bad influence on yourself because you weren't taking the time to invest uh, mentally and physically and emotionally into yourself? And kinda... I, don't think those, I don't think those things were necessary because I wasn't, um, I didn't think I was going to benefit any. I don't think I was going to tremendously benefit from society's um, rewards because um, it's not society's fault. It's just my manner of thinking. My manner of thinking is that uh, I, just took responsibility. That's I have to take responsibility for everything I do because the only reason why I'm even here today is because I chose to be here. You know what I mean? Like, in other words, don't get me wrong. I, random accidents can happen, and that's beyond our control. But to uh, that's the only reason why I'm at peace at all within my life is, um, is I just have to maintain responsibility because... Uh, that's the only thing that gets me to where I feel centered and I don't, like, you know, at peace with myself in the sense that if I could own it, then I can do it. In other words, I was taught at a young age that if you're willing to face the consequences for something, then you could do whatever you want. But you, obviously you don't want to do that if it's going to be detrimental to other people. Yeah. But if you're just worried about, if it's just yourself and it's something you could sacrifice, well then... Um, there's always benefits to everything, you know. I mean, don't get me wrong. Uh, th- I'm not saying uh, I'm not saying society is a bad thing. I'm just saying that I found gray areas that I was willing to like make work for me, and it just it wasn't it wasn't a, it's not a misery, you know, for me. Now I now so instead it, of blaming, it get the dynamics get interesting when you get a partner, though. Yeah. So yeah, I'm gonna get to that. But so in an aspect of so instead of you blaming society or your past relationship or past traumas you, oh i choose you, to be you here chose, you chose to be here yeah i'm yeah. choosing to be here as of now because i haven't made uh i haven't really made who, who else can i blame if there's not a timeline on the wall and a deadline on the wall to have a certain goal you know achieved if i'm if i'm not making it a priority you know what's funny is that's i have to own that i i want to make it a priority but some things have just gotten in the way and those other things were more of a priority i guess than what right, i was what doing was, now well, so okay so what was what do you think was more of a priority than maybe having a home do you, do you feel maybe having a home was going to set you back the things that you wanted to well do? when i had when i had housing of my own in my own name like an apartment i had um um society um collapsed a little bit like in 2008 with the housing market yeah. i had a really good job i liked i never ever i never found a career in my life and never decided to settle on a career and then all of a sudden i had one that i loved out of nowhere and this job I got, I just loved it so much. I literally was content with making it a career. 
I was there for over a year and um, I never missed any work. I was never late even for an entire year. Um, I was hired on, my contract was bought out from a temp agency because I did so well. And I was totally content. I was living in a town I liked. Everything was picked, I picked everything out, kind of made it my, work for me. And uh, then they, they, they had, I didn't have enough seniority that when the, the, the market crashed, uh, I was put on this. I was put on unemployment. Now, unemployment was a death sentence. But um, Good money back then? it was $256 a week or something, which I don't think was bad at all. Minimum wage was what, $3, $5, $5? Oh, no, shoot. It was, uh, this is 2008. Oh, 2008. Oh, shit. And I was, I, I mean, I wasn't. That's, 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 I mean, it's at least. It was like I was making $17 an hour, so I don't know what that was uh, equating to, but. Uh, but I wasn't able to keep my apartment, let's put it that way. Okay. And um, at that point, I started brushing up against at the same time because, well, sometimes the trouble can find you. And if you don't put a stop to it right away, you know, you're going to let it get in your life. Um, well, this is the ironic thing. Now, I had closed crack out of my life within a year, two-year period way back in the 90s because I knew it wasn't healthy. And I, well, I didn't think it, I knew I, I was doing it because it was unhealthy, I guess you could say. But I knew it was unsustainable, you know, as any kind of way to live. So I, I, I found a way to get around that. And uh, once again, now the confidence you build from something like that is not necessarily a good thing because that will sometimes feed your arrogance later on in life if you want to check, run up against a challenge like that again. And um, that's exactly what happened. I ran into that challenge again. And um, I was willing to uh, just say, well, I'm feeling bitter and, and dismayed or whatever you want to call it and pissed off at society because I just had this great thing going and playing it all right and they just pulled it out from underneath me. So now I'm going to cry and whine and fucking uh, basically like... Uh, I need a, what do you call it, uh, this is a reason, a cry for help, and so I'm just going to smoke some crack and just destroy everything, you know, let it fall out where it's at, and, um, and then pick up the pieces again, and uh, so eventually you get old enough that you don't want to do that anymore. So that's what the, to that's do that what a couple the times. change was to make you Yeah, you just, I have a bad, I have an issue with anger, I guess you could say, and then um, bitterness where you feel, yes. well, when you're younger, yes, yes I do, yes. I know how to mitigate that to a point, but what I'm saying, when you're younger... Very good. I'm glad she was able to sure let, turn the camera on her. She, That's a consistent thing. It's just, oh my God, until he's ready to stop. Yeah, and, and with that me. Is. And it's with like me. An airplane with no stop. Well, she's amazing because she um, she has that bone in her body too. Now, that's not a bad thing. But when we meet each other, um, sometimes it's kind of like one of those things, like one of those relationships where it's like, you know, she's going to get hers, and but I'm thinking, I'm going to get mine. And then I realize, no, dude, you just need to take a back seat, okay? Because this is the battle of sexes, and you're not going to win. <laughs> okay. Yeah, unfortunately. So, so how is that? So speaking of relationships, yeah, I mean, how is that now dating a transgender woman? It's fantastic because you know the best thing about dating a transgender person. I came up with this on my own. Is whenever you want to be intimate, you get to have a threesome. They threesome another man. Another woman. No, it's, no, with one person. Think about that with one oh. person, and it's very mo it's convenient. You don't have to deal with anybody else. Wait, wait, explain that to me. Wait, hold on, hold on. That, 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 wait, hold wrap on, your mind around wait. that. But I can't that, discuss that, that just, on camera. Oh, okay, okay. We just with taste, just to be a taste, you know. Um, just uh, you be, yeah. But you know, what I'm saying. In other words, you get to have the best of two people if that's what you're into, so to speak. Ah, okay. Now I understand. Wow, yeah. I didn't even connect the dots to that. What else? Yeah, I got hit with an epiphany by that one day, and I was just like, wow, maybe that's what I was always after because I was always a little bit on the fringes, man. You know, like I always got, I've always thought of, um, I've always wanted to take something to the next level when it comes to, uh, I'm like a hedonistic mentality, man. I like pleasure a lot, you know, but. But I work hard to have that. If it's a job, I'll work hard at that. If that means um, being really cheap and frugal and teaching myself how to fix my car because that's what I need to do to have this money for recreational drugs, I do that. That's what I've always done has been like just to teach myself things. So they, I, I guess that's also fed kind of an arrogance in me where I think, oh, I can overcome anything. Yeah. But you know what? That's detrimental when you, when you don't keep it realistic. And maybe that's where the substances come in. When you're using substances a lot, sometimes you might lose a little touch with reality. I think you're a little bit, you know, I can do this, I can do this. And as you get older, you realize things get a lot harder. Things get a lot it's more difficult. You say that kind of, that's, that's what sparked the kind of you moving from transgender to where you're at now. Because actually, the, I, I started watching transgender porn because I actually enjoyed seeing, for me, I enjoyed seeing a woman that, that is actually having sex with another woman. Uh, yeah, there you go. Even that's a man that's having sex with another woman. Yeah, there's no empowerment. Because I'm, 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 not, I'm not attracted to men, actually. That's exactly kind of what I'm dealing with. <laughs> yeah. Is that I, um, I've, I, I've, been, I've been, I've been, I've um, been, how should I say it? I've been with men only because I, I like maybe wanted to have like a freaky moment, like where I wanted to go outside of my comfort zone and like do something what I would consider somewhat taboo. Not by, but not by society standards, but in the way that um, I didn't, I, you know, in other words, I had to experiment with a little bit, that, a little bit with that to realize that it wasn't for me, really. 
And it wasn't really so much the, the sexual nature of it because I'm a romantic, so I always kind of parlayed into some kind of romantic notion in my head, I guess. I'm very passionate. But what I mean is that I've, I dated for a real short period of time, I dated a couple of men, and they turned out to be some of the most um, controlling, <laughs> very, very difficult people to live with. Let's put it that way. At any point, man, jealous, jealous, like you wouldn't believe. I'm not a jealous person. You I don't think you never felt jealousy? Do you, do you, oh, I, I felt jealousy with Frosty. But it, I have to, I have to tamp yeah, that down because believe, I can't let her have that the angle too much. Do you, you know what I mean? Do you believe jealousy is natural and you should have jealousy? Um, you know, uh, that's a tough. That, well, yeah. I, why wouldn't the emotion exist at all? Now, now jealousy is one of those things. It's just like a drug. If you the, if you abuse best, it, I think it's the best combination of love and hate. Right, but I mean, for lack of a better word, hate's just, well, you know what's, what's interesting is hate and love are both four-letter words, so you got to be really careful with what you're playing with, you know? When I, when, you know, there's not a, that draws them even closer together. I mean, obviously, if you hate somebody at all, you still care about them to a point because you wouldn't be thinking about them and investing energy and time in them. But where it becomes a problem is now, do you want to control in every aspect of their life to get what you want? Yes. Because that's kind of a demented reality, I think. Yes. And it's because, demented. Yeah, You're I taking was, away free will or something yeah, like I that? I was in an open relationship for about seven months, and I realized that those fear-based emotions, whether it be jealousy, insecurity, codependency, it was, or me, yeah, or me, comparison, uh, unhealthy relationship with it, I realized that those feelings, once I felt those and got past them, I realized that those only made me appreciate that person that much more. And Thank that you're you. You're supposed to feel that because there's no light without dark, right? There's no that's chaos exactly. without order. There's no Batman without Joker. That's right? exactly what I was trying to, 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 okay, put, okay. to, to, to emphasize when in the beginning you said, um, now how can you, how can you compartmentalize a, a toxic relationship as you needed toxicity in your life? That's what I needed. I came out of such a benign relationship before because I actually dated my ex, you know, my, my, my daughter's mother, yeah. who was a great person, but we just don't mix anymore. We just don't. I wanted somebody that was bland at that time in my life. Why? Because I didn't need another partner in my relationships or my relationship that was um, going to add gasoline to fire. I didn't need somebody that had, I didn't need two habits or I didn't need to support their habit. I didn't want a partner that would drink as much as I did or whatever excesses I had in my life that were going to cause me problems possibly. I didn't need that. So I wanted somebody who was like, for lack of a better term, square or whatever, and that I could mold. And she, she, I really, I spoke to her about that before I dated her, and she said, "That's was cool." That a control thing? Was no, that, no, I didn't. That's what I. That's what that I think. Of, that, that would compliment you. I, I, I never wanted. That's what I emphasized to her was I never want to mold you in a way that I'm. I never want to be manipulative, and this is a difficult thing to, to express to people because they would think, "Why wouldn't you want that?" I didn't have an issue with power and control. Her mother did, and ironically, she's the one that's the manipulator. And she likes to manipulate her and wanted to manipulate me or whatever. And unfortunately, that's why she was worried about her daughter being manipulated. Why? Because she can manipulate her daughter and she thought I was doing that to her. And uh, so that relationship fell apart. Oh, good. So do you believe that people control other people because they don't have control of their own lives? I think sometimes do you that... you think she didn't have control over you and her life so she wanted to control that situation? I think in that situation, the reason why her mother wanted control of that situation wasn't because of the current affairs, but it was because it, she had some kind of guilt attached to her. Um, because she was living vicariously through the, she wanted to correct the past and she wasn't able to control her life when she raised her daughter. And that's why it was repeating itself. Now she was going to do the same thing to her granddaughter. She pushed her father, she pushed her father, she pushed her daughter's father away for some reason. She wasn't taking responsibility for the things she was doing wrong, so she tried to put it on you and or everyone else. It's really hard to understand because, um, once again, um, it kind of paints me in sort of like a like an arrogant light, but I've had nothing but time to analyze this. And it's like, I don't even fault her mother for being that way because we all can slip into things that we don't understand and, and, and start doing because, in other words, like she, her mother was a hard worker and she wasn't able to raise her daughter the way she wanted to. And, and in a Latin family, you know, they depend on fam familia, their family, which I find absolutely amazing. And that's what I wanted. That's why when I had no family, I chose the partner I chose at that time because I was trying to create a new family as well by dating this person. And that didn't really work out well for me because I wasn't that accepted over time. But um, the interesting thing was is that her, gran her grandparents took care of her. Do you think you had more of an idea of her than you did actually loving her? Uh, pardon me? Do you think you had more of an idea of her rather than actually loving her? Because that's what it sounded like. No, I mean, um, I, w I, I was very passionate and I wanted to love her the way she wanted to be loved. And uh, we had so much communication, I don't know how the only communication we didn't have with what was was what she was going through with her mom behind the scenes that was influencing our marriage. And I thought, we can't have that. I told her, she said, you got to put a stop to that right now because if you have, you know, if you're letting somebody like be in your dirty laundry and you're a grown adult and it's causing you pain and it's causing me concern and you're not letting me address that issue and you're sweeping it under the rug, now it's just going to keep flaring up again. 
And all you got to do is just tell your mom, hey, I love this person. I want to be with them. St step aside. And uh, if she loves you, she'll come back. If she doesn't love you, well, then you're not really losing much. But I don't know. I, don't, I can't tell. I can't make somebody do that. Um, now, um, you know, she, she was, I just think maybe she wasn't as mature, prepared for what her mom was going to throw at her. And um, it just, we, I, it wasn't going to work out well. And the sad thing was, is that I was stupid enough to think that, um, well, I was selfish enough, mm. selfish enough to think that by having a child that that might bring us all back together again. And um, I, I, cause I made her, I made her, before I even tried to make my child with her and impregnate her, I told her, I said, now before you even try this, I said, please tell me that we can somehow, even if it doesn't work, we're gonna stay together somehow and fake it to make it, so to speak, not in a relationship, but in, in a way to bond. My daughter has both parents. Promise me that now, if, and we can make that happen. Otherwise, I don't want to have a child, really, you know? Because I didn't want my parents to, I, I didn't know how much it affected me, but I equate my problems in life to maybe um, having that separation anxiety of my parents. And that, at least the supervision to keep me out of trouble, like, I, but that was all on, you know, I still have to take responsibility for my actions. I chose to do the things I did, but um, thankfully I don't have a lot of legal trouble in my life. But anyways, I wanted my daughter to have everything she needed in some way, some kind of stability like that. And her daughter, her mother didn't even have that. She loved her, you know, her dad was pushed away by her mom. And then her mom did it again. It was just bizarre because um, in the end I had to, doing every, doing, I was sober then and I tried to do everything right. And I tried to be sensible and not raise my voice. And I tried to get, we, I had all the communication, but nobody was listening. So there was no communication anymore. And, uh, so you were taking one step forward and 10 steps back because you were trying to control no, the situation? No, because I wasn't trying to control it from, from to get it my way. I was trying to mitigate the risks of it just getting out of control. Okay. I wasn't trying to uh, be power hungry or nothing, but no, I... Well, not power hungry, but it seems it was, you, you wanted a mother in your daughter's life, and it seemed that yeah. it wasn't working between you two. Well, so it seemed like you were taking one step forward you, to then keep taking five steps back. Well, her mom not years. being involved in her life wasn't an issue for me, really. I mean, like, what I mean is that if she was physically present, that's all we needed, because I just wanted my daughter to have access to her mother and know that she was there. I mean, I don't think that I would address those issues if it was unhealthy one step at a time. But I was I was so wholeheartedly dedicated to being with my daughter, and I was I was I was uh, like the homemaker, so I was home all the time, and I was able to do that, and I had no um, I had no issues. The only time we had issues was when her mom, my daughter's grandmother, would watch my daughter. My daughter would behave in the ways that I taught her, which I kids should be kids at some point, because they don't have a long childhood and the world's rough. So I would let my daughter. Um, do silly things like jump on the couch, but I would stand there and protect her from the floor so she wouldn't fall down. I didn't let her do this for long, but I let her get it, you know, to try it out, get it out of her system, stuff like that, be a kid. Now, when she would go to her grandmother's, her grandmother had a serious issue with that. And um, she would you bend these things to, uh, you know, make me look like I was an irresponsible parent, so to speak, taking unnecessary risks, or I wasn't, I wasn't fit to raise her, or whatever it may be. And uh, I wasn't there to witness it, but my daughter would find out that there was tension there and she would go brag to her, brag to her grandma about me. My dad lets me do that. My dad, so she felt like I was undermining her, I guess, mm -hmm. undermining her. But then I was getting the same pushback. Oh, you're undermining me as a parent. And when you don't have communication, you have nothing. So um, that didn't last long, especially when you're, when, when, the, when her, the grandma, the baby was mom. Was communication, but there wasn't comprehension behind it? Because there's a difference. Well, yeah, her mom refuses to communicate. It's just that. Was, it, was she trying to communicate? Were you talking? But it just wasn't. Oh, uh, no, I was. Understood? Um, she, uh, she's one of those people that she doesn't speak to anybody, really. Okay, she's so just really cut off. She's just, no, no communication. Yeah, like, and she makes her mind up. That's it. I just, uh, I, I just, uh, I just didn't weigh those options as being an issue when you get, you get blinded by having a child because it sounds like some, such a great thing, especially when you're excited about it and you forget that there's always some things you forget that are going to be significant, you know, and you think you could, um, well, in, in my life, I, like I said, I've been so overconfident most of my life that I could do things because I usually do well when I try hard that you miss those things sometimes, no matter how hard you try not to. There's always some things you miss. You know, um, you can't go that slow, not in our society, not to catch everything. Nobody's that perfect. Do you think a lot of times you're trying to be right? Because there's a quote, and I'm about to mention it. It says, I enjoy being wrong because then I learn something from it. It says, I don't care about me being right or wrong, but I care about what is right or wrong. Yes, that's, that's fantastic. Do you feel like you lost that at a certain point because you're overconfident? Uh, well, yeah, maybe in that aspect, like, um, you can't, well, I couldn't digest or I couldn't digest all the information sometimes. And I didn't think I needed to because when you've ridden a bicycle once and you know how to ride a bike, you just think I'm good. Now with her mom, if you, if I didn't have the feed, yes, if I don't have feedback to make good decisions, well then how do you, or, you know, or, or she doesn't have feedback, the feedback she's getting, she's just blocking it out because it's, 
she thinks that I'm just trying to tell her what to do. When you don't have communication, what do you work with? You don't have anything, man. You never had a foundation really to work with. So her mom was already kind of sidelined from the get-go. Now, was she going to stay that way? No. And she found a way to leverage my life differently. And um, that significantly changed my life. Um, I wasn't, it, I mean, uh, when you're living with somebody and the means that you're supporting that person to live there is, is um, non-financial. When you don't have those means before you because they're just like, well, you're, we, have, we have a grandma, we, you're insignificant or whatever. There's not a whole lot you can work with there. And um, the, uh, now what I need to do to get that back is uh, I need to find a way to get housing. Now, so what do you think it's going to take for you to, do you want housing at this point? How long have you been homeless? Yeah, three years. Three years? And this, and well, technically I've been homeless on paper uh, since 20, September 27th, 19, I mean 2013, when I got out of prison. I mean, legally I've been I haven't had anything in my name. I haven't done anything to, uh, that's what I'm saying. I, I was in a position with my ex that. Um, so before prison, you, you said you were already homeless. And then. Now yeah, well, I was homeless in the same relationship. Okay. So, I didn't know that. Okay, that's what was left. I didn't know that. So in that relationship, even with her, you were homeless. All right. It's really strange, man, wow. because she was um, she was still very good to me. In other words, like you, um, you weren't living with. She had a, she I was a living relationship. with her for a moment, but her when she wanted to cohabitate with her sister, her sister didn't want me to be there. And so that was when you kind of you kind of spiraled and started doing. That's that. when I spiraled because I thought, well, wait a second. Right. If I'm married to you and you're not willing to go to go to the plate, I don't want you to be homeless with me. I would, what I want you to do is step to the plate with me and, and mitigate, figure this out. Now, when you do that, when you just kind of step aside and I'm like, wow, it's like that, huh? But yet they give you the one thing that you probably shouldn't, you shouldn't take from them, like financial gain or not gain, but financial necessity. Like they were giving me money and I, well, I had unemployment. I was homeless with unemployment, so I was spoiled. And I just, you, you know, I used that to um, act out, I suppose, uh, you know, just I was gonna I was gonna recreate on my drugs, you know, and I was gonna do my thing, and but that was long before I had you know decided to be responsible with children and all that stuff. In other words, I, I was I, you know if she didn't like it, I was like, well, hey, I could stop, I could just I could we could work work with me over here and we could figure this out, but otherwise I'm gonna do this, take it till the wheels fall off, and that's when I went to prison. But prison I made work for me in the sense that I knew I was gonna go there with the behavior I was putting out. And I just used it as a respite. And I, I used to catch up on the classics. And Because you can psychologically make it work for you if you want to. You don't have to make it detrimental. Just don't do drugs. If you're going to do drugs on the streets and you're going to do drugs in prison, well, then you don't have chance, I think. So I told myself, when I go to prison, even though there's tons of drugs there, I'm not going to do any. And I was successful to the point of just I smoked a tiny bit of weed, which didn't alter anything. So but, you, uh, you didn't have any money. I didn't have any debts in there. I, any debts that I incurred, I paid for it immediately. I had a little bit of support, you know. So do you think if you were to switch your mindset to thinking that maybe, because what's more important? Well, my mindset right now is that if I want to be successful, I got, all I got to do is push myself and be successful. And right now, I'm just being a cop out, kind of, I guess. So what's, I have to be responsible. what's more important to you? Do you think what's more important to you is outcome, rewards, and money, or do you think what you should be searching after is purpose? No, what I want to, what purpose and fulfillment is the, 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 yeah. The reason why you do something is because you want to fulfill something in your heart. Otherwise, what good, what good is it to, to you if you don't feel it? If you don't want it for you, then it's not gonna. It's not gonna. You may get it, but it's just not gonna have any significance of keeping it. You know, it's just like it's a materialistic thing, then, right? You're putting it outside of your body. You could just lose it as quick as you could have it. So that's why homeless. Yeah, that's this is the, the, the this is the quandary I have. Okay, if you could live without materialistic things or with them, then. If you don't have something in your heart, then what desire do you have to really hang on to it if you do get it? It loses its value. And without intrins, 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 yeah. intrinsic, thank you. intrinsic value, then, then something ceases to be, it's an encumbrance almost, you know what I mean? It's just really crazy uh, that we can get on a philosophical level like this because housing is not an issue really, but um, I think they need to remove, uh, they need to follow through more on their end for a lot of people out here and um, not make you feel like you're being game played. And then people would feel a little bit more, um, um, they would have more in, 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 intrinsic value of their self. It sounds, like, it sounds like for you, not having a home seems to have more opportunity for you to do the things that you want. And maybe... Indulge my artistic side, yeah. Yeah. For what? I like to write. I wrote through prison. That's what got me through. I'm a writer, you know. Oh, okay. um, so you think that that's going to be the purpose and passion of what you want to follow? Cause it seems this is the purpose and the passion of what I want to follow, purposes of the passion. This... And then my, have my daughter and my and my life enough. Not my entire, you know. I'm willing to share co-parent with my the baby mother, um, well, whose name is um, Maria. By the way, and so oh, there's Maria. people out there. She has a name. She's a she's a she's a human being, and she's a decent person. But we just don't see eye to eye on things. 
that's uh, I had to put that bitterness aside because I wouldn't be able to live with myself and own everything and be happy in the streets if I let that baggage come with me. You know what I mean? I wasn't. I was depressed if I let that baggage come with me. That was uh, just going to feed into like me drinking too much or something. Okay, um, so that means that this is this is a very interesting question that's going to probably open your mind a little bit. Is understanding that I always say a woman and or if you enjoy man men is a third priority, right? And I say my first priority is the health of not only the health and peace and safety of myself, yes, people around me, and the number two is my purpose, my passion, my my goals. And then comes the third. He's right. So do you feel? I feel. Having, do you think feel not having a home and being homeless? Really, is 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 well, you find that within somebody else or some something outside of you? Um, that's what we're trying to. Uh, well, that's exactly what I'm balancing now. Is that um, to be in this person's life, my transgender partner, yeah. who she is amazing. She's, a, but she's a, she's a. You know why she's amazing? She will not settle for somebody to just sit on the sidelines and not do something right. And you're going to do it well. And you're going to do it in your heart because you want it. And you're going to do it in your heart also because you want it for you. Well, that's how you have that or her or this or whatever. You know, her, she's the most special thing to me. So if I don't feel it in my heart, it's not going to be genuine. And she will see right through that. So what, what I'm trying to do now is I have to work on me. And working on me at this time right now is like getting my IDs back, going to work, getting back into the success seat. Because bottom line is that whether I want housing or not, if she wants housing, she's going to have it, okay? And she's going to have it with me because I'm going with her and I'm not going to leave myself behind. Now, um, getting all this stuff together just takes time. It's not, uh, it's not impossible. And um, basically, the, the tail ends of that other relationship are what's going to... That, that's what was making me homeless in the sense that I wasn't trying to hang on to some bitterness, but uh, I was floundering, I guess, because I chose to. I needed some time to readjust myself and... At my age, I wanted to get a little, let my hair out a little bit and just, you know what, I'm going to run with this and have like a little good time with it, I guess. And I'm also going to, you know, reinvent myself and uh, get to know myself better. And then I, when I was, I knew myself pretty well. And then when I reinvented myself and I realized that there was a part of me that I had no idea, a desire in me that changed tremendously my outlook on life was having a lifestyle change that was so fresh and so aw amazing that, uh, I had to I had to learn myself over again. I had to learn myself over again, and 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 it was it's hard, man, because you know what? I'm dealing with a person that has a complicated nature themselves, and um, people are complicated. But do you know what? Do you want somebody to be perfect and be simple? No. So these challenges are awesome, and uh, so every day is a challenge, you know. And do you think I, perfection is a disguise of insecurity. And do you think oh yeah. Do that? And so do you think? I think a being, lot of times when it comes to not only transgender, I mean, this is separate. But transgender or LGBTQ community, a lot of people have to accept themselves for who they are and so they're the most authentic people that, that are Yeah, around. that's so exactly that, what the spirit of her is all about. So I feel that way. She, she, she tries to poke holes in my character in a second. If, I, if I'm if i not 100, she's, she's going to let me know. Good, good. And I, I feel like that's what true love is. I think, mm. what, what, do you, what, do you, what do you think love is? Because I think a lot of people think that love is someone accepting you for who you are, but I think love I believe love is an abundance of self-love that you have overflowing yeah. yourself. So she has a lot of love within herself to say, hey, I have a standard. Self-love love is an I think I got standard. It. And her standard is saying, hey, this is not right. I have to say no to things that don't serve me for my past, present, and future. And and say, no but let's just put it this way. But you also, you also when on the split flip side, not only say no, you open, but you also, when lo love can be given, do you also give Absolutely. that on, 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 yes. do you think she balances that as well? Mm. Or I think, I think she makes me rise to a challenge that is in my heart. And I'm very passionate about things that um, I'm still, I, you know, I have to adjust myself because I'm living in two worlds sometimes where, you know, on the streets you have. The, an extreme relaxed environment if you let it and just let it roll off your back if you're adjusted to that you know if that's your mentality and that's and it's not a challenge to you right so you have this extreme environment to where you can just live like a, an open hedonistic mind chill back and relax and then she's stepping up and she's and she's you know and then she's acting almost like a parent or a mother and saying you know what i'm not going to settle for this you know you're going to do it this way and you're going to step up and that's what i would almost call at first 
the toxicity is this pick, this push and pull. It's not toxic. It's just we all go through phases where we don't want to. We're why not like quite say, ready yet, but she's like. Say, why would you mention the word toxic? Huh? Well, because that's just the the outside world's that. way that they they throw at your relationship. They think if something's not working. And, well, it, and there's contention there. And you're holding her accountable. Exactly. And that's what I'm saying. Toxic is not what it is to me. The challenge is what I need. And this is what I, I need. Somebody, awesome. She's okay. my positive influence. And you know what? Everybody else is negative, And they don't like us because we want to do right. You know, not everybody else, but the people that are out there that we buff up against. And there's these people trying to destroy us all the time. And we just stay away from them. But you know what? Being, me and her also have our, our, our shortcomings as human beings where we can have our moments where we feel, we feel weak and we, we give in too much or whatever. And then um, you can let things like substance abuse slip into your life for a minute or two, or, or bad habits come back. And that's what it is, is that we're most happy when we're challenging ourselves and we're propping each other up, codependent on for, for a good purpose. But when we go down the road and do the negative, um, we, which is, which is. well, just whatever, we fall into our bad habits, okay. whether it's recreational drugs that become substance issues. Yeah, yeah. And the sad thing is, is that some of us still enjoy doing them to where we can we can do them without them destroying our lives. But guess what? It's why I became single in the first place. I may have been a drinker and I paid my bills and I was never a mean drinker or a violent drunk. But guess what? It'll still push people away from you, like women. And that's where I'm at now. So it's like if I'm doing something that's going to push her away from me because she says so, it doesn't matter whether I like it or not or, you know, I need to step up and fix that. Yeah, so I think I would, disagree. I would have to disagree with the aspect of... It in other words, on what you're, because it depends on what you're doing, whether it be smoking, what, it depends on what you're smoking, whether it be weed or, or there's, a, there's a big difference between weed and crack. Well, but I'm not talking about I'm crack. Okay, pers- cool. I mean, crack's been out of my life for a long okay, time. Cool, cool. I'm talking or, about like, what, you know, like and, crystal, and, like meth, meth okay, or something cool. or speed or something okay. or whatever people want to call it. Because it was, yeah, uh, I'm just saying that if you're doing something like that, it's still, um, you know, there's a lot of people that feel, even if you can maintain that, which is possible, believe it or not. But it's still detrimental because obviously it's bad for your health, and it makes you it paints you in sort of a, um, a lower class light. Possibly, some people are not going to respect you a certain way. And um, in other words, it doesn't have to destroy you as a relationship. But if it becomes a contentious thing, well then, you know, how do you measure that? In other words, like if you don't want to quit, well then maybe that's the part that your partner is the problem. Well, you know what? I don't want to paint somebody like that really, because I know that. If that person's more important to me than the substance, well, then that's what I need to do. But, um, you know, once again, human beings are complicated and things just don't happen overnight. So it's hard. Every day is a challenge. It's always going to be that way. But then again, every day is still a privilege. Uh, I'm not unhappy. I think uh, if you would ask me 10 years ago where I would have been today, I would have totally, completely laughed you at you. In, do you believe in happiness? Absolutely. Because you know what? All you got to do is, you're the master of your own destiny. All you got to do is get up today and say, I'm going to be happy. And um, that's pretty much all you got to do. But don't get me wrong. You could still let little triggers get to you. And everybody has weaknesses. So okay, we, might, we might be saying the same thing. But the reason, and, and this is very controversial for a lot of people, but the reason I don't believe in happiness is because I believe happiness, and I, I don't believe in the pursuit of happiness, right? Right. And the aspect of happiness is emotion. It's something that, that, that you comes can, and goes. But I, yes. believe in, I believe in fulfillment. Well, yeah, comes from certainty, uncertainty, contributions, yes, fruition, you know, growth. Happiness is something fleeting. Absolutely. And and people don't understand the aspect of what it's the pursuit of the happiness, not happiness itself. The yes, it's like the chase is always better than the catch. Yes. The chase is what makes you feel good. The journey is what's important, not the destination. So how do you? So what is your perspective, kind of, on happiness? I think we're saying the same thing, but I'm not sure. Uh, I just like I said, um, being able to be in touch with myself, the way I feel and the way I like to live. Um, is, is it, it puts me in certain places and uh, that's what I like. I don't really necessarily, I don't let the place define me, but I just have to be me. And um, well, that's what I'm doing now. I feel generally happy all the time. Uh, you know, there might be a little chemical imbalance here or there because I have them, but I have my coping mechanisms that I use. I use walking, exercises, a tremendous, anything that's gonna increase serotonin levels or anything like that okay, works that's fantastic. Cool. All right, so do you think we're here to be happy? Or do you think we're here to struggle and learn? Well, that's a fantastic question. That's very philosophical. I think we are here to struggle and learn. Yeah. Happiness is just an emotion that we, I think we put too much on it. Mm. And that actually is why I came to the, through the idea that I was telling you before. You know, if you, build your, if you build your confidence too high to be able to overcome something for happiness, and you're able to do that, then you can almost dilute yourself to, um, it almost just increases the pain when you don't get what you want. I do. I believe that. Mm. See, the human brain is such a fascinating thing because it's very adaptable, right? 
but the same adaptations that make it strong in a situation when it needs to be strong and it needs to be in a survival mode are the same adaptabilities that can destroy it with an addiction because it wants that substance so bad. It'll give you symptoms that you, exacerbating symptoms that you're using that substance to treat just so it could have more of that substance that you're abusing, that you abuse now. It's fascinating because I think the human brain that is... Substance con- could be anything. Right, be person, it, could be it, could could be it could be the happiness. It could be the happiness. That could be a drug. That could right. Be- so, I mean, like, at the end of the interview, what would we have as answers? I think that the, the open-ended questions are that um, the, the answers are just always going to be fleeting because, you know what, if you're just grasping at answers, man, then the chase is better than the catch. <laughs> Maybe we're right on that. I don't know. The chase is really better than the catch, right? I would think so. Yeah, because you know what? Like I was telling you before, if I'm not learning something new every day, then I'm not, I'm not exercising my mind, and then I'm not, I'm not really feeling happy. Having a, having a moment with you like I have today, the time that you set aside, that in itself was uh, showing some, um, was showing some um, appreciation that I have to think was cool. You took time out of your day, you know, yeah, you wanted a certain, you know, you're not going to sit there and, um, whether it turned out good or bad, you wanted to take the time to do it. Now that right there makes me feel significant because I don't need people's, uh, I don't need people's opinions or people's, um, I don't need them to value me, so to speak, to make me feel good about myself. But you still need to have, um, you still need to have human contact. You still need to be sociable to a point. We can't, I, I cannot isolate myself totally. And um, I like anything I don't understand because I'm, it's, I'm curious enough to the point where I don't want to kill, hurt myself with it. But sometimes there are little dangers that come with it. But um, So for people to understand a little bit more, a challenge do, you, is good. do you have any tips? This will be kind of the last few yeah, because you yeah, need to close your interview. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. no. I took good. creative control or something. No, no, no. please stay creative. I, I love that. I can cut it up, make it, make it work. But is there any tips that you would recommend? Because actually, and I got actually, a good one. I've actually gone intentionally homeless for the past nine days or so, and I say intentionally because I have the mindset, I have the skills, I have the wherewithal to right. get any job I need to because of the connections I have, the person I am. Yeah. But I understand from what you were saying, and that's why the questions I was asking is because. The homeless part of for me is understanding that a lot of times when you do have a physical home, you realize that 80% of your time is taken up with priorities that are that are outside of you, whether it be whether it be insurance, whether it be your right. friends or, or kids, and, and so that's what it's that's what it's been for me, and that's why I'm home, intentionally homeless now. And and so that being said, do you have any tips for okay. anybody to? to if they are homeless or if they are listening to this or if they want to understand why you're in the situation we're in the situation we are right what tips would you have to give people when it comes to just being homeless okay and why that's the case okay um like if you're facing homelessness whether it's intentional by yourself by, by your own means or like you know just you had bad luck or whatever first of all try to set bitterness aside man because that's an encumbrance that you just don't need there's so many things out here that are going to come at you that are powerful influences manipulations uh, temptations for that matter that are going to blindside the hell out of you so it just minimize not only your physical aspects of what you're carrying every day or whatever and simplify your life but emotionally do that like get guilt is one of those emotions that all we got to do is put it down so get rid of guilt put it down man you don't need it dude that's it that simple it sounds crazy but it's that simple um then just sit there and just you know you have to understand that um you know like i said bitterness is just you're harboring negativity now that's only going to glob onto you and, st- and, and harness itself. You know, you're going to feed it and nurture it. And uh, the people out here have a lot of that. Not everybody's that way. I can't judge everybody. But, um, you know, there's people that are positive too. And uh, I don't think the power of positive thinking is going to, like, create miracles. But it's definitely, it's like, it's like that we were talking about happiness. Happiness is a fleeting emotion. Do you have to have that to, be, to feel good? I don't think so because you're going to always be chasing it. So that's going to kind of hurt you in its own kind of way because you're going to be disappointed a lot. Now, um, but just try to just focus on in, in simplifying your life. The, the more zen-like, the better. Um, and uh, just keep a positive mental attitude. Don't, I, don't be so delusional as I am to where you could let positivity literally overcome you and you could be gullible and ignorant sometimes. Not ignorant, but gullible to the point where, oh, yeah, I, it'll get better. It's not that bad, you know. I can do that too, you know. And um, you, have to live, you have to live on the bone, man. You have to live to, close to the... Uh, you're going to be close to people that are not going to want good for you. There's going to be close to people that are going to wish you well. But just try to stand up on your own two feet. To, uh, go for a hand up rather than a hand out. Um, motivate yourself and use coping mechanisms to keep yourself motivated. What are, whatever they may be. You know, if it's anything that um, is going to be questionable by society standards, well, then find a way to do that 
with as much privacy as possible so it doesn't become an issue because that's one thing you won't have when you're homeless is privacy. That's the biggest thing that encumbers me. If you want to have a relationship with somebody, especially if they're an alternative, alternate relationship, alternative lifestyle, a transgender, that could be a big problem. So you have to find ways to make that work. And um, if, let's just put it this way. Being homeless is just a challenge. Uh, if you don't let it, uh, the outside influences challenge you that much, it's not hard. Um, that's it, really. Just be motivated and keep believing in yourself because anything's doable. People did this for thousands of years, lived on these kind of mar these mar margins. So. Well, if there's anything, I know you said there's no handouts, but if there's anything to help you, I have, this is only $10 right now. I'm still struggling on my end. Yeah. $10 for Circle K. That's something, man. Yeah, yeah. For you, you know what? There's some glucose guys. that I can, you know, I can get. get some glucose. I can get a lot of glucose. <laughs> and believe me, glucose. You glucose, you mean, you mean glucose lubricates the machine more than. <laughs> You know, that's great, that's great. That's I mean, you know what, this, I can buy anything with this, okay, right? It's just, this, this is a lot of alcohol. I think you are cool enough to be the, no. I, I did, sir, I did, I did a Circle K because you just, I don't know. I mean, I, I folks, know, I, I didn't want to give I don't, you, I didn't want to just give you We don't money. advocate alcoholism, but you know, if you'd like to drink, then enjoy yourself, just be doing it responsibly, right? Yes. And last thing, I just, I mean, I wanted you to write a message for the next person. All right. For the next person that I do interview with mm -hmm. that also could help. I got, I got this one right here. I just, I felt like I wish I could have patented this one or, or, or copyrighted it or something. Yes. So I'm going to write this. Um, you, can, you can write it and read it at the end. All right. I love that. Drink. I love that. I and I get brainstorms, you know. We are here for the jungle story to bring <laughs> people's stories to reality. And that's through mindset, through relationships, and through connection and minds and, and understanding how to get that out to the most people. And I think this right here is gonna be good for the next journey. And and in, and hopefully in the next few interviews, maybe I can give out more. I'm gonna call them the jungle kingdom kits. And I wanna bring people suitcases, heated blankets, and, and maybe more you know, gloves and food and more gift cards I'm gonna pile it in to actually be able to give back to the community. And if you can help support in any way possible, the link will be in the bio. And I appreciate you all for listening. And let's see what he has okay, to say. Okay, so next I wrote, Love life, or ironically, it'll make you a hater. <laughs> this is by Juan Dahl, and uh, I've been homeless since 2013. Yes, and yes, we approve I've, that message. So that's what yes. I like to do. Well, thank you, brother. There you go, man. Thank you. I appreciate you. No, appreciate I appreciate your time, man. Really. Thank you. Thank you. It was cool, man. I wanted to, I wanted to further your, your, your dreams or whatever you got going with your brand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, to be able to be attached myself to anything positive makes me feel good.